I know I think people are still filing in. Sorry for the delay. I just wanted to, um, as I had messaged to the waiting room, we were waiting for more board members um, to come in. Unfortunately, we've had um, a couple of board members uh, have to call in sick because of COVID. Um, so we are short planning board members, so we cannot, we actually don't have a quorum at the moment um, for uh, the planning board. So the planning, this will officially be, you know, forum hosted by the planning office. Um, we'll still run through and do the forum as planned, um, but I just wanted to make the announcement that um, the planning board won't be taking any action at this meeting at this point because unless we get another planning board member, we're one member shy of uh, a quorum. So um, there won't be any um, you know, action items taken by the board. So having said that, and people probably won't catch that, but as they come in, as, as participants continue to enter, is a little past seven. So I think we should go ahead and start. You all have come here, I think, for a um, public forum on uh, an update and overhaul of the city's um, zoning ordinances for the commercial areas of downtown Northampton and uh, Florence Center. So uh, what I've thought I would do is go ahead and start with a presentation. Um, as we go through this, I'm going to share my screen and we can start um, with that. One moment, please. Okay. Um, and um, so this, as, um, as I said, can you all see the presentation on the screen? Okay, I'm going to, I need to disconnect one thing. Um, hang on just a second here. A little technical difficulty, so one moment. Okay. All right. Okay, we'll start again. So, um, welcome everybody. Uh, as I mentioned, we're gonna be talking about changes to the commercial districts in downtown Northampton and Florence. Um, what, what, what I'd like to go through tonight is sort of explain what this is, how we got here, the, some of the details for both downtown Florence and downtown Northampton, um, and then the process moving forward, and then we'll open it up for questions and comments. So it's really meant to sort of run through all of this and, and then take um, comments from you all who've um, come tonight. So, um, why are we here? Why, why do we need this change? Well, we've heard and we've seen through um, various projects and avenues and requests from people in um, throughout the community that the zoning is stale. It's not meeting the um, current market demands. We've changed, retail trends have changed um, since the last time that we've really uh, um, taken a hard look at um, at zoning, and we want to make sure that we keep up with those trends. We want to provide opportunities for new housing and dining and other retail opportunities or other commercial opportunities for businesses to expand and get a foothold in. Um, we've heard that, and we know that um, one big block of zoning doesn't necessarily address the individual characteristics of different parts of these downtowns of both Florence Center as well as um, downtown. Um, and also there have been some projects that have been completed that um, aren't quite consistent with what people feel is appropriate for downtown, particularly in Florence. We know we've had examples of projects where um, 
there's been dissatisfaction with, let's say, um, you know, on the corner of Maple and Main, uh, we know we got a lot of um, pushback and concern about the way the building meets up to the public um, space and the sidewalk. And so we knew we didn't really have the right tools to address that, or the planning board didn't have the right tools to address that. So that's another reason um, that got us to this point. Uh, the zoning influence center is the same as other highway business district or highway oriented business districts. So Damon Road and um, um, Con Street, which is a very different characteristic than um, the village center in Florence. And we heard that residents want zoning to reflect that character. Um, and that, you know, particularly in Florence Center, that um, uh, folks wanted to have a specific uh, zoning district that was tailored to that sort of character, that feel, that um, sense of place. Um, in downtown, all the, similarly, um, we have a large central business district, and um, yet there are still blocks within the central business district that um, are very different. So what is a form-based code? Basically, there are rules for um, build-out, development, reuse that incorporate or merge the rules about design and use into one document or a few um, parts of documents. It, it's able to differentiate between um, different uh, sections of the downtown. It can it addresses both the private building side and uh, the public street interface and uh, creates dimensions for those things so that they're consistently implemented and that there's a set of tools and rules that both people um, who are applying for projects um, can see and have and understand as well as the planning board and the central business architecture committee. The goals are really to um, create through pictures and graphics what that vision for the build out would be for any new spaces or new buildings that are created to enhance pedestrian space and frame the street with those new buildings and essentially create a very clear path for applicants going forward. So, um, and as well as for the planning board to understand what, what will be expected, what is expected. How did we get here? Um, in 2018, we hired Dotson Flinker, a local uh, landscape architecture and planning firm, and they've really shepherded this um, through the whole process, uh, been a great um, partner for us and have um, organized focus groups in the fall of 2018 with Florence Civic and Business, the Downtown Northampton Association and Chamber. We had public forums and um, held in 2018. They helped, uh, they, they put together business and property owner meetings, stakeholder forums all through 2019. And then we had um, public forums la uh, a little over a year ago in the fall of 2020 before getting to this point tonight. Um, so in uh, to go into specifics, let's start with Florence Center. This is a map of the existing zoning. So what we're talking about in, in um, sort of massaging this uh, regulatory structure is looking at what is on the ground now. So this is the pink that's on the screen is the general business district. And then the purple area is currently office industrial. So this is the bike path um, that runs um, behind and parallel to uh, Main Street. And this is the mill building that runs along the bike path in the back and that's zoned um, office industrial. A second zoning district that covers the rest of the um, Florence um, Center is general business. And then the orange surrounding that is the urban residential B district. So um, what's proposed in terms of the map um, and map change is really the same area with a, um, a few additions, um, but to divide that, take the two commercial districts and reconfigure them still with two districts, but really more uniquely tailored to um, different parts of Florence Center. Um, 
and I don't know how big this picture is showing up on each person's screen, but I'm just gonna um, orient people here. Um, this is Main Street here. See my arrow, Look Park is off this way. Downtown Northampton is in that direction. And um, this is the intersection of Maple and Main. And this, I'll start on the um, sort of north um, west side, this area that's currently zoned office industrial is proposed to be brought into a general business district, um, but referred to as Florence um, Village General, um, along with the other light pink around. And then there are two other modifications that would bring um, parcels into the Florence um, General District. And those are the library and the civic, um, um, Florence Civic um, building here, and then the Seventh Adventist Church, excuse me, um, across the street would be, those are the sort of modifications to existing zoning. Otherwise, the um, rest of what's currently zoned general business would stay um, within um, the business districts, either um, center, which is the dark pink, or uh, the light pink, which would be um, the general business zone. And I'll explain those um, in a bit here. So the components um, based on feedback would be to differentiate the different parts of Florence Center, create flexibility and allow updated uses that are consistent with commercial and housing trends. That means allowing for ground floor residential. We heard um, a lot that there's not enough flexibility for uh, having um, housing or multifamily housing close into the center that could support um, new business or expanded business in the downtown um, in Florence Center. Um, also, there's some tweaking of other uses that aren't currently allowed, but that would be allowed in this context. Create again, create predictability for um, and this would be applicable to new buildings or additions that would apply specific design and form to be consistent with the way um, the uh, village has built out over time and define expectations for that development. So there would be in the in the upper right here is that light pink area, which is the uh, proposed to be sort of that supporting. Um, commercial area um, to the core. And this dark pink would be Florence um, Village Center, where you've got um, a concentration of buildings right up to the street um, there um, that are multi-story typically. And then that's Ma Maple and Main over here. And then um, Main and um, Chestnut Street where Cooper's Corner is and the Pie Bar and the medical um, building there would be sort of two nodes. Um, where again, more flexibility, but um, street presence or sidewalk presence of commercial space up to the street with residential sort of relegated to the back portion of the building and up above if it were desired um, for in new building. For downtown Northampton, um, this is the existing zoning map as well. Um, the red area you see is the, is, um, central business, it goes on, it starts sort of on the north end at uh, North Street and wraps around to State Street, um, uh, goes around Pleasant Street, and then there are these red boxes along Conn Street and a little bit out Bridge Street. We also, as part of sort of the downtown area, have um, three other districts. We have an entrance business district from the bike path on King Street down to North Street. And then we have general business district, um, Pleasant Street going down to the roundabout. And there's a little bit of office industrial as well along Holly Street that's part of this uh, proposed change. So this map, again, is sort of oriented not north to south, but to fit on the screen. And I, so just to orient you to that um, framework, up on the upper left here, stop and shop is off the map. It's not right on the map, but, and then down to the right is the Con Street roundabout. Um, and then 
in between is a lot of pink. <laughs> um, but this center section of pink sort of represents the existing central business district. And then the louder, the really light pink over here is the uh, where the stop and shop label is. This area is entrance business. And then this is the area that's general business on the other end of the central business core. Um, and so the proposal is to essentially take four of the existing commercial zoning districts and create three that would then create sort of differentiated rules about form and layout within those areas. Um, and the proposal would be to, ref to refer to those in um, as central business as the umbrella district, but then have a central business core, which is this dark pink, central business gateway, which are these two ends, the gateways, and then are all surrounding that core would be a central business side street district. Um, there are also a few modifications to bring in um, parcels uh, from residential into this commercial district, um, which would be, um, uh, you know, we're looking for feedback on that. This is Edward Square, which is um, surrounded by commercial now, but is currently urban residential C and it backs up to the railroad tracks and the bike path. Um, Allen Place, there are two parcels here that are urban residential C that would fill in a little gap there. And then there's some urban residential C um, properties along Holly Street that are again, sort of sandwiched between commercial, but back up to the railroad. And then there, as I mentioned, office industrial that we would bring into either um, gateway or side street districts. So for the core, it's really sort of bringing the focus of the existing design guidelines that have been in place for 20 years down to that um, core spine of Main Street, a little bit of um, King Street and Pleasant Street down to the bike path. Um, and still use the same um, design standards that, and guidelines that have been in place. Um, uses also substantially remain the same for this core um, district, but it creates the, the, this new form-based code would create predictability about what's expected on the sidewalk side, the public realm in terms of street furniture and setbacks and, and step backs of buildings. Um, and yet still include those um, other design guidelines and still have Central Business Architecture Committee be part of that review process for this core area. Um, the side street district, again, is sort of the immediately surrounding areas of uh, a long sort of um, one block back off of Main Street, essentially, and out Bridge Street and down um, uh, down Pleasant from the bike path south to about Hockenham Road. Um, this is differentiated from the core in that review would be by the planning board. There would be a new set of design um, guidelines that are very specific, again, to create predictability, yet flexibility, introduce multifamily housing, uh, so housing on the ground floor, and other uses that are not currently allowed, but that we feel will address changing market trends and the ability to um, in, increase um, opportunities for um, those types of uses that then will have a spillover effect and beneficial impact on the commercial um, core uh, where the strong retail uh, presence is currently located, retail restaurant entertainment presence. Um, but again, addressing the different characteristics where you've got buildings that are set back a little bit further from the sidewalk than on that commercial um, core. Um, so then the gateway district is yet again different. And these pictures sh show examples of that where buildings are set back even a little bit further. Um, there might be some more green space um, between the sidewalk and the building. So create a set of standards that are very similar to the other districts, but also um, allow more flexibility in building design um, 
and uses, again, sort of opening up opportunities for uses that aren't currently allowed, particularly on the ground floor, um, and create predictability in the form and design requirements, um, defining those expectations so it's clear from both the applicant side and the planning board, and it, again, streamlining, streamlining the design review with one board. Um, instead of creating a two board um, review process. Um, so just wrapping up for both of these districts, um, we're really trying to clarify the standards that are already for the most part, part of the planning board's review. They're just not spelled out specifically. So some, it creates confusion and sometimes misunderstanding about what's required when. Um, and so we wanna spell out those um, ways in which if people are proposing to do um, tree plantings or in, um, provides, you know, table or furniture or other kinds of um, space between the buildings and the sidewalks, how, how you would do that, what are the parameters around that. Um, so a little bit about the process. We're here tonight to sort of present this before it formally is introduced to city council. We love public um, feedback and questions. Um, and then we're gonna do sort of a final cleanup code review and then pull all of this together into a package that would go to city council. We're hopeful that we can do that in March um, because as you've seen from the beginning of this, that you know this has been already a three, three and a half year process that we've been working through this. It is, um, part of it is that it really is sort of complicated pulling all the pieces together. Um, and then after it's introduced to city council, it will um, then start a formal public hearing process. So this certainly isn't the last forum to hear from folks. Um, potentially that would be April or May, it's sort of all dependent upon that sort of preliminary review. And then um, after the public hearings, it goes back to council for adoption. And I will say this package, even though there, um, you know, there's sort of one, um part of the package that's sort of the primary piece of it the changes that are proposed have um a little bit of ripple effect through many different parts of the existing zoning so the whole package is going to be comprised of um maybe as many as 20 different small ordinances um so that's what kind of we would just need to dot all the i's and cross the p's before it actually gets introduced um, so that's it for my presentation, and um, I'll leave this slide up for a couple seconds, um, just so if people after this um, forum have further questions or comments and they want to submit something, um, my emails here and more information can certainly be found on the web page, especially as we develop the package as it's going forward. Um, so I'll leave this up for a few seconds here. And then um, for people who do have questions or comments, um, if you could use your raised hand and I'll call on um, Wayne and George, who's the chair of the planning board to help me find people if I'm not seeing them um, with questions. But I do see a couple of people um, right off the bat. So I'll start with, um, I think the first person I is Jackie Balance. So I'm going to stop my screen share now and I can always put the slide back up if people have want the email address again. And of course, it's always on the web page um, that you can get. So um, Jackie, did you want to start off? Thank you, Carolyn. Um, there's aspects of this um, proposal that are very exciting. I just need to ask and I, I, I tried to read it, 102 pages of new ordinance is a lot, but right mm -hmm. at the beginning, it, it references the sustainability, the city sustainability plan. And I have to ask if there's anything in this ordinance that would incentivize fossil free 
building and renovations? Yeah. Um, so good question. Um, this is really, uh, this is the zoning ordinance. So it's land use regulation. Um, the building code dictates what is and isn't allowed in terms of systems to be used um, in individual buildings. So this um, zoning regulation does not address that except that in, um, so as it relates to um, fossil fuel free system, that's really a building code issue. Okay, um, Amy K. Lane. Thanks, a quick question. Um, I'm wondering if you could talk for a minute about how this dovetails with the Main Street redesign and whether um, because that is going um, building front to building front, whether this um, code would change any of the decisions that have already been made or maybe narrow possibilities for future decisions. Yeah, so we um, were very careful not to sort of dictate what, uh, particularly on Main Street, because Main Street is, although it's the Main Street, there are also so many other pieces of the downtown and Florence Center that are part of this. So there's no specificity about sort of the dimensions of that particular design. So they're, um, they can complement each other and this certainly doesn't um, override anything that, um, the Main Street is a very specific design piece that happens on its own separate track through its own separate process and this will not. Um, affect that in any way. Even in terms of like sidewalk width or anything of that sort. Right, so actually this is really, um, so this, so there are public realm standards, but they don't dictate how wide a sidewalk has to be in, um, a, in front of a particular building. And, and in fact, um, the, um, that was done deliberately because each street is so different um, and the right of way dimensions are so different that um, we didn't, um, and DPW was very clear that they would be concerned if this um, specified um, those kinds of details uh, because of the wide um, range of um, layout that we have now. Thanks. Yep. Um, Joel Russell, I don't know if you're next. I'm, I apologize. I'm just going to run through the hands in order. I'm sure we'll get to everybody. So go ahead, Joel. All right. Thank you. Um, well, I've, I've been involved with form based codes for a number of years. I, I'm a professional zoning consultant, and I used to run an organization called the Form Based Codes Institute, which is a national organization that promotes best practices in form based codes. And, First, I, I just want to congratulate you on um, undertaking this process. I think a form-based code is definitely a way to go to improve uh, the quality of design and, and make for a more vibrant uh, downtown. I think it, it is important to coordinate what is being done in the zoning with what's being done with the redesign of Main Street. I understand the problem that their conditions are so different, um, but most form-based codes are drafted with those two things that, together, the, the street, it, the whole idea is to unite the uh, the public realm as it affects individual buildings along the street and the streetscape itself, the, the sidewalks and, and street. Um, so I, I hope that those two things will be brought together successfully. Um, the, the, the draft, you know, it's long and complicated. Um, I hope that, and I don't think it's very self-explanatory. I think it would be really helpful if um, something were, that's short and concise and very readable were produced that is kind of a guide to understanding it so that people understand how to use it. And also if, if you or people on staff or the consultants could run through some examples of how it would be applied so that people can see what would actually be built and how, how the code would affect that. I think that would, that would help people understand it and, and be more likely to support it or, and be able to give you um, useful comments on it. So I think the graphics are, are great. It's good to have them. Um, and they really do help see what the vision is. Um, so, um, you know, overall, I, I, I'm really glad that we're doing this and I hope people will 
take the time to get to know it and um, engage with it. So thank you. Thanks, Joel. Um, Adele Frank. Thank you. Uh, I would like to say that um, I really love many aspects of this plan and I especially really appreciate the flexibility and uses that it contains. And, um, and, I, and I think it would really be wonderful for Northampton. My concern is that um, one of the flexibility areas is in multifamily housing, assisted living, I've seen hotels. Um, and that raises the specter for me of a lot more propane tanks um, in our downtown areas, which I uh, absolutely do not want to see because we're in a climate emergency and will set us even further behind from reaching our goals. So my question is, why not add an incentive to this plan that would say, yes, if you want to do, if you want to build multifamily housing or assisted living, et cetera, um, just as we do in URB and URC for, for increased density, we provide a, den a, a bonus, a density bonus, uh, that would be the same for multifamily housing in these areas um, and, and therefore in exchange um, require them to be fossil fuel free. And uh, I, I strongly recommend that. And I would, uh, I would not think that that would be a very difficult addendum to this plan or a, a, a very difficult change to make in this plan. Thank you. Yeah, just quickly, um, you know, I appreciate that. Um, uh, we don't, right now, um, multifamily housing is allowed um, by right. There's no, um, the, the limits are not based on lot size like they are in urban residential C and urban residential B. So um, we don't have, uh, we certainly want to encourage as much density as pop possible in these um, districts and clearly making um, residential units right there in downtown is much better in terms of carbon footprint than having them um, dispersed out um, and further afield where it's not as walkable. So we're accomplishing a lot of um, benefit by encouraging residential right in the core where there's access to uh, multiple transportation modes and so forth. So um, because we allow sort of, um, uh, there isn't, I guess I should say, there isn't a mechanism to do um, a density bonus um, necessarily unless we're talking about, you know, increasing heights. But again, sort of, as I said before, the issue about um, use of uh, propane is um, an energy code and building code issue. And, um, you know, we're hopeful that uh, more and more um, folks will turn to all electric um, systems for their building. But thank you. Okay, Jessica. Hi, thank you. Um, we were talking actually to piggyback the idea of um, flexible use spaces in the downtown areas. Um, one of the things that we've noticed about housing trends that have even changed in the last four years is that we're in a housing crisis. Um, and I was wondering what efforts the board has looked at to use inclusionary zoning language um, for affordable housing and not, not just low income housing, but median income housing. Um, I know that Massachusetts actually has a plan for smart growth and opportunity that Cambridge and Boston and Hanover have adopted. They have um, this language kind of already framed out for different communities. And I wondered what efforts the city has done to even look at that so that people who work in the city and these new encouraged businesses can afford to live there. Yeah, so <clears throat> one of the things that Northampton um, and what this ordinance does is allow more residential units, um, you know, off the main street. So we're hoping that opening that opportunity for more housing types will encourage, again, like you said, not just affordable but accessible housing, um, which is one of our key, um, 
one of the things we've been working on in sort of multiple prongs throughout the last year is to look at ways that we can encourage different types of housing in different districts. Um, inclusionary housing is um, a, um, a structure that um, can be used successfully in markets where there's lots of housing demand and very expensive um, housing development like the eastern part of the state. Um, and that's because the development of the market rate units can cross subsidize those units that are required to be included. Um, it's very hard to accomplish that in our market and also, and I would say in the Pioneer Valley, I think it's more, much more difficult. It's not as applicable as it is in the Eastern part of the state where um, land pricing and cost of um, housing is so much higher. Uh, that it's hard to do on a small scale and we don't have the size of housing developments that are happening in the eastern part of the state. We know this from experience that we've had, we've had inclusionary housing as part of some, uh, and in particular one subdivision, and it was approved over 15 years ago. The applicant is still having a difficult time creating that subsidy across the units because our market is so different and it's so hard to do, you know, on the scale that we have here where there might be two or three units as part of that 10% requirement or 15% requirement. So it's definitely a different market here and we have looked at that strategy, but we don't think it um, is workable here. So we're looking at, we look at other strategies just to encourage you know, and expand the opportunities for housing across the board. Thanks. Um, okay, I'm not sure who is next, but I see um, Thomas. Uh, do I unmute myself? Or can you hear me? Yes, you're good. Yep. Uh, okay. Um, so, hello, everyone. Um, so, my name is Tom. Uh, I was just actually wondering. If the I didn't get to see the presentation, but if the code um, has any setback requirements, particularly having to do with the commercial require, or I guess district on King Street, which is currently a very car centric, um, you know, design language, and if I mean we've seen like the new development in Hadley where they're still having businesses, you know, that are not fronting the street, and if this new code would require, I guess it's a maximum setback basically to have the yeah. business. Um, like at the sidewalk and, you know, put parking in the rear? Yeah, so good questions. Um, for many years, the general business district, which, um, and the entrance business district, which exists now, don't allow, as well as central business, I should say, don't allow parking between the street and building. So there are um, examples of existing situations where um, properties were built before that time, but this is absolutely a good opportunity to sort of reinforce that. And that's one of the issues that um, will be addressed in this code is to very clearly specify, even though it's been in the regulations, it's not clear necessarily for everyone coming into this to know that parking needs to be sort of um, put to the side in the rear of buildings. But um, the short answer is yes, there are what we call build two lines. So buildings have to be built within a certain distance um, of the street. And those vary depending on the sub districts that we um, talked about. So Florence Center is different from King Street is different from Pleasant Street or um, you know the side streets. Okay, uh, thank you. Um, Robert Ross, uh, you're muted. There you okay. Go. Okay. Sorry. I thought you mu muted me. Um, <laughs> well, I was going to talk about Florence Center, but since uh, King Street got brought up, I will uh, chime in on that as well. And I'm hoping that the zoning might correct some of the mistakes that have happened in the past, where actually it asked to have buildings front on the street, but it actually fails. It has failed twice that I can recollect in recent times. Um, the Popery, the uh, Bill Willard. Uh, project that just happened where they put the Starbucks in, where they actually put back doors on the front of the building, 
where there might be glass on that building, but it really isn't storefronted on that building. And I would hope that that could somehow be readdressed. It also happened on the Dave's Soda and Pet Food Store that's now the Goodwill, where they have a vacant storefront where weeds grow up in front of it. And you know, uh, storefront windows that rarely get changed. So in yeah. some, trying to do a good thing, we end up with absolute, absolute opposite bad thing that somehow needs to be corrected. And, you know, that's like either it's a workaround or it's a, right. or it's just neglected. So this district, these district changes aren't going to address that end of King Street because that's a, that's still the highway business district, but absolutely those, those, that level of specificity is written into this to say, you know, you have to have, um, 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 number of doorway entrance ways to your business, um, fronting the street, um, um, discussion of window glazing, um, other elements that um, where the openings have to be oriented towards the street. So the idea is, particularly because we say, you know, right now it's, we're talking about gateways and areas that are much more pedestrian friendly, the whole point of creating this. Um, these um, guidelines, not just for downtown Northampton, but also for Florence Central, which I know has been, um, you know, of concern as well for folks um, and making sure that buildings really are sort of speaking to the street front. So yes, those um, that is addressed in this. Okay, and back to Florence Center. I, I have been involved in this process from the beginning. I feel that I've been listening and paying attention and uh, giving good feedback. Um, I was a little concerned to hear about and learn about putting residential living on first floor in the commercial zones, which has been a fail in other communities. Uh, Turner's Falls is one that comes to mind quite readily, where it actually devalues the commercial property and uh, lessens the vibrance of the downtown. So the way, so, as um, I showed on the map, there are two different sections proposed for Florence um, Center. And um, it's really, it's sort of comparable to the um, sort of the side street core um, classification for downtown in that uh, ground floor residential really wouldn't be allowed in the first portion of buildings that are in those Florence um, village center um, nodes, um, but ground floor residential would be allowed on the, sort of the back street, sort of going up Maple Street and back behind those buildings that front Main Street. The two couple of areas that um, sort of fill in between the nodes are areas where um, uh, it's proposed for ground floor residential, but not for the entire um, length of that Main Street corridor. Right, which is, uh, I assume, between 28 North Maple and 34 North Maple, correct? For one um, that would be considered, yes, the general. Which, so which is North great incubator space at this point, and most of it is rented and doing quite well in the way that it is managed at this point. Yeah, and this would only be, I mean, you know, we've had, so I can't remember which um, Maple Street ad address, I guess it's 30, maybe. Um, but, you know, there have been um, the other piece, especially with um, starting in that sort of um, as you're heading towards the bike path, we don't allow the kind of commercial, some of the commercial uses that are in that building. So we also wanted to update the zoning to allow that to happen and allow more flexibility. So this is not saying that everything's going to turn over to residential, but it could be allowed if over time as market um, changes and people's um, property owners interests change, or maybe they can't rent to a retail or commercial space, they have the option to, you know, um, convert to a residential space, but it's off the main, you know, main street. Fine. That's the that's I know. I just wanted to point out that those buildings are crucial and they are commercial buildings. Mm -hmm. And we've already seen an exodus from downtown Florence 
with the expansion and building of Atwood Drive. We've lost a lot of uh, professional office space to Atwood mm -hmm. Drive in Northampton because a new type of commercial space was built and enforced and uh, readily available by large commercial clients. Yeah, I mean, and that part of that is just the general economic trends, uh, particularly in the medical field, you know, there. Um, and there's, I don't think there, there's not much the zoning can do to shift those trends. But what we're trying to do is create enough opportunity for other types of users, small businesses and folks that then can start up and, and create a new path of commercial um, entrepreneurship in those buildings um, as, you know, larger um, tenants move out to um, other space. Thanks. Thanks. Um, so I don't know who is next, Ben. Um, do you want to go ahead? And then I'll sure. get to you, Bob. Sure, I've got, got a, a, a quick question, which I just couldn't find in the in the draft uh, uh -huh. code, whether there were parking requirements or parking limitations in the in the zones that have been opened up, particularly for um, uh, residential use. Yeah. So um, the we haven't really tinkered with the um, parking allowances or requirements, meaning that what's um, on the books now for parking is essentially what will be um, allowed or required um, in the new zoning. So for example, in um, the current central business district, we don't have a minimum, we don't require additional parking. Um, that's staying the same. There are a few uses that are required to have parking. In um, currently in Florence Center, we, which is general business. Um, the zoning re only requires new parking for new footprint expansion. So the reuse of buildings or adding a second floor onto an existing one story building does not require new parking. Um, and that stays the same. Right. So I guess I would encourage you guys to consider that if one of the benefits of increased density that comes from opening up for more op opportunities for housing is more density and more potential for car-free living, uh, more potential to use public transportation and, and cycling, mm -hmm. that um, parking requirements that then kind of wipe out the use of certain amounts of down or you know business district land um, should be uh, reduced or eliminated, because um, because otherwise you're kind of taking from one, with one hand and, and giving with another. Um, and then the other thing, again, related to transportation, in the code, it describes the vehicle throughway. Um, and it says vehicle throughway, area of public right way is typically dedicated to motor vehicle lanes. It sometimes includes bicycle travel facilities. And my worry is that when cars are so heavily prioritized in the, in the language, that that will become, uh, that we will carry forward into the future, a continuation of our car centric design of roads. So it, now I, I know you said uh, that the DPW is concerned about constraining the width of the roads and, and constraining the uses because there may not be width, but in these newly opened areas, right? In the, in the areas where you're increasing flexibility, it's actually not that many roads. Right, it's, it's you know it's a it's a fairly limited number of streets, mm -hmm. and therefore it makes sense that you could, for the form of each of those things, actually define, here's where bicycle facilities should be. Here's you know in other words, in, in separate give them a separate space instead of mm -hmm. just vehicle through throughway. And sometimes you might let bikes go. Yeah, I mean, good point. We can uh, certainly look at that language and and not. Um, I think we could probably massage it to to um, be more um, prominent for um, alternative vehicles. That makes sense. And then just back to the parking piece. Um, 
you know, we do also have a provision existing that allows the planning board to reduce the total parking spaces if there's a rationale. So there's either through a site plan or special permit, the planning board can reduce that required parking. Um, so, and we also know that even in the downtown where we don't have required parking, applicants are still wanting to provide parking because their market studies have shown that they need to provide parking or maybe even financers aren't going to finance without some parking. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't think that means that, you know, I think it's something to keep an eye on in the future, mm -hmm. um, but we certainly aren't proposing to, um, you know, uh, modify that right now. But um, that's a good comment for sure. Right. Thanks. Thanks. Um, Bob? Buzz? Well, well thank you. Well, thank you. Um, can you hear me okay? Yeah. Um, so uh, w the thing I guess I'm really interested in, I think of this project, this whole effort, um, being one that looks five years, 10 years out, um, you know, versus just, you know, for the next year or two. And the area I, I, I'm sort of interested in is the east side of um, Northampton and particularly downtown. And I think of the east side as as being the stores and businesses and all that occurs in Ward 3 um, on the other side of the bridge. And, and when you think of that, again, think of five years, 10 years out, what their role will be in there. And you look at even today that, you know, we, we have some major businesses there that are part of the history. You look at Joe's, um, they're clearly part of the history of, of Northampton. Um, and then the uh, historic Northampton um, is one of the largest sites we have in Northampton, downtown, you know, and as they expand their role, you begin seeing, you know, just the potential of what they can do. And then on Holly Street, uh, I look at um, Center for the Arts, which has been doing a magnificent job in terms of all the programs they have going on. Then, you know, yes, Bledos in there and Roost and all these others. M my question has to do with recognizing the potential of that group, um, you know, that has a significant history, but also a significant future. How does all that fit in? How does how do, does the east side fit in? Um, so, um, you know, part of this um, zoning is divine. I mean, part of that east side is already zoned central business, but it's treated the same way as what you know you're dividing it east and west as the west side on the other side of the bridge and what this um form based code would do is sort of break it off and say this is this is part of a side street district so we're not going to uh we're going to look at it slightly differently but still have the same kinds of uses allowed the same intensities except you know, ground floor residential would be allowed, which isn't currently allowed now. So you could do multifamily housing on that side that then could support, you know, more um, potential business growth, um, the more residents you have sort of surrounding that downtown. And so um, we, I think in that way, um, sort of looking at those differences, thinking about how those neighborhoods are, um, those that portion of downtown is slightly different. Um, that it's addressed that way. But I agree, this is going to be over time. The idea is setting it up. So it's a clear, there's a clear standard for people going forward and understanding what that vision is and understanding how to, you know, how one person might go through the process. Got it. Okay, good. Thank you. Yep. Um, Lily? Yeah, hi. Um, I, generally speaking, support this um, zoning change. I think it makes a lot of sense. Um, I wasn't able to look at the map really carefully, so I couldn't tell Carolyn, so maybe you could elucidate. Is there, so starting from the central business area of Northampton radiating out, it seems like that there are a loosening, uh, there's a loosening of some of the, the um, strictness around density, the further out you go to the gateways you described. Um, is there any, is there actually any change that you're proposing that would increase the business area so that there is greater density further out from the center of Northampton so that we're actually growing our dense urban downtown, kind of like what you all did with some of the, um, you know, the, the large development projects along Pleasant Street, which um, ended up 
spawning a lot of more pedestrian and economic activity because it suddenly became this um, really well-designed dense area where it felt very exciting to walk. And, and there were more people living there. Um, so we currently have, as I mentioned before, sort of four commercial districts um, along uh, sort of that make up this what people might think of as sort of downtown Northampton. And um, going up King Street has been central business all the way to Summer Street, Dunkin' Donuts, um, is the edge of the current central business district. So all the density allowances are in place already, um, as well as sort of going um, um, down um, Pleasant Street towards the roundabout. However, um, beyond that, sort of from Summer Street to the bike path, um, changing it to um, a cent from an entrance business zone to central business would um, increase the height allowances in, the, in that area. So by that could potentially increase the total number of residential units, for example, that you could do. So there is that sort of expansion in the sort of the gateway areas, um, but already those densities were allowed um, on the King Street and Pleasant Street corridors in either direction, north and south. So allowed, but not required, right? So I'm thinking of, say for example, if you, if you take Pleasant Street from the center of town out toward the roundabout, it, it very quickly goes from what feels like, you know, uh, a business district to suburban sprawl with, with the parking lot near service center road. Would there be, and, and that's now going to be in some kind of gateway zone, would there be any requirement for if there were any kind of redevelopment of that property for that parking lot to turn into something dense and multi-use? So these were these regulations would be effective when someone proposes to do something on a parcel. And at that point, then yes, your building has to be, your parking cannot be in front of the building. There are some provisions for not pre-existing non-conformities, but you know, if you're building a new building and you're planning to do multi-family, let's say, that building would have to be um, um, at at or a little bit set back from the street with the parking to the side or the rear. There's a minimum height um, in that district of um, 20 feet and there's a maximum of 70. Um, and there's there are, um, guidelines for how much of that frontage along the street has to be filled with a building. And what if there is parking to the side of the building, how is that designed and structured and where how do you hide it, essentially hide that parking with other elements. Um, but there's certainly not a mandate that you build a five story building, you know. <clears throat> um, it will be whatever the applicant and the developer proposed to do and then there are parameters around that so um, okay and then just one one follow-up to to bob ross's comment um you know the new starbucks on king street that where the you know the drive-through where cars are just lining up to go through the drive-through in front of the of the building so that technically there's no parking allowed in front of the building but all that the the, the person on King Street is experiencing when they look over to that building is a line of cars. So finding ways to close those loopholes because that's not, that's not the intent. At least I hope it's not the intent. And it's certainly not moving us towards solving our climate crisis. Right, but you know, people who continue to drive to start, I mean, we can't force people not to get in queue at Starbucks. But um, the design piece is certainly important and something the zoning can address. So thanks. Um, Elaine, would you? Thank you, you Carolyn. <laughs> yes. I just wanted to wanted you to make it clear about the Holly Street area. Okay. Is that currently it is not residential on the first floor? Is that correct? 
correct. So are you proposing that it will be commercial or what are you proposing? Or is it a fact that with this new code, is it going to be residential on the first floor? Or what are you saying about the Holly Street area? Um, the zoning currently where it is central business zone does not allow residential to be on the street side of a building. It has to be back. If you're, if you're on the first, if you want to build residential in a building, in a multi-story building, mm -hmm. you have to have a commercial presence along the sidewalk and your residential can't um, be in the building except above that or in the rear of the building, sort of on the other side, let's say facing the railroad tracks. Um, this zoning would allow residential units to be on the street level from front to back. Um, so it doesn't mean that you have to do that. It just is an allowance that instead of commercial, if you felt that um, your property was better suited or the market was better suited for residential, you know, top to bottom, then that would be a, an allowed uh, arrangement um, within the building. I will also say that the whole idea behind this isn't to create permanent buildings that will, once they're built with a use, they'll never change, but it it's allows flexibility. So we can go back and forth between different types of uses because we don't, the idea is not to constrain someone into one particular use, but to have buildings that frame the street and the uses become less um, important because it just opens up that flexibility of transition back and forth between. Thank you. Yep. Um, I see Karen Carswell. Disappeared. Okay. Um, Eric B. Hey there. Yeah, so this looks like a great step forward. Um, and hopefully it'll prevent the uh, imposition of corporate design designs on the uh, Northampton, which we which we know results in, you know, sometimes you don't know what town you're in because you see the same exact buildings and stores and stuff so it looks great i just have a few um concerns or points to make um, i agree with ben it seems to be car centric it seems to be okay the travel lanes you know they are what they are and then every, whatever is left over gets divvied up instead of saying okay what, what are the overall needs for this section and, and how do we balance those needs you know there seems to be a reluctance to narrow car lanes and We've already seen, um, the, you know, for these past few years that um, we've traded off parking for outdoor space to support our businesses and, and keep our downtown alive. So that, that to me, that illustrated the value right there of, of the public space having priority. Uh, when it came to down brass tax, we made that choice and it was a great choice to make. Um, so, uh, yeah, so there were a few specific things. Um, we're requiring concrete sidewalks. I mean, I, I thought this would be an opportunity to really, I mean, concrete is great, it's durable. Um, it's better than asphalt, but it's, it's, it doesn't really have much going for it aesthetically. It would have been nice to go to like a large format paver or something a little bit more aesthetically pleasing and also reconfigurable without um, having to destroy it in the process. Plus concrete, I, I believe is a high global um, warming potential material. Um, and then uh, no mansard roofs. I was like, wow, that's really weird because that's pretty. That's a pretty common um, New England building design element. You see that all over the place. So I, I, that, I was like, that's a weird limitation to impose, I thought. But anyways, I, I, yeah, I think that, you know, you need to consider the whole design. That, it's just, anyways, um, that was all my comments. But yeah, it's, it's definitely... Uh, Great to see this moving forward. Thank you. Appreciate that. Um, I guess I'll just before. Okay, it looks like Karen came back. Um, but I just want to answer briefly. The reason why we don't have we don't use pavers for the public sidewalk is really 
um, ADA accessibility, and they're much harder to maintain um, and um, maintain that even surface. Um, so just wanted to throw that out there. Um, Karen, you're back. Yay, it was right when I was about to speak, our internet went down, so thank you. Um, so my question is, I couldn't find it anywhere, but basically when I heard uh, Bob speak um, about, you know, Turner's Falls and other towns, I thought, okay, when you were re looking at these zones, what towns did you, was there a benchmarking study? Um, is there something that can help us visualize a little bit more about what that might look like um, based on your findings? So in terms of, you mean implementation? Um, yes. Yeah, I, I mean, um, there are many towns um, across the country who have, that have adopted form-based codes. Um, and the, as Joel Russell um, um, described, you know, there's this whole form-based code institute and there are many examples there. So yes, there are lots of the communities from which to pull. Um, you know, this is a hybrid. Most most form-based codes are hybrid. You know, strictly speaking, um, codes really are trying to focus on, um, and it's much easier when you're doing it from the ground up, a brand new community. And you can say, okay, for this new community, we're going to adopt this code and we're gonna build everything from the ground up. Um, but given that we have existing conditions and also, uses are still important. I mean, many times communities say, we're not going to really consider uses so much. We're really focused on form. Um, so, you know, we, in fact, we um, had um, the uh, director in Somerville look at our plans because they adopted, again, they focused on a hybrid and not and incorporating um, uses because that's still important to the community there. And I think we think it's important here as well. So, um, you know, there are lots to pull from and I can certainly, we can put links on our webpage for, for you to look at. Thank you, that would be great. Yeah. Um, Lily, did you, well, like before we go back to second round, are there other people who haven't spoken that want to chime in? My hand shouldn't be up. Oh, okay. <laughs> Thanks. All right, Joel, I guess you're up. Yeah, I, I have a, I have a, another response to uh, Karen's comment, which, you know, is an interesting one. Um, the, the thing about form-based codes is that they're, they're based on what's already there. They're based on looking at what are the best, what are the best examples of good urbanism in your community? Um, right. And they're very much customized to your community. So you, I mean, you can look at other, what other cities and towns have done, and that, that can be interesting for comparison purposes. But one of the real advantages of a form-based code is that it's, it's based upon what you have in your community and what you want to see happen in that community. So, so I mean, I think, you know, we have the best stuff for Northampton already. We can certainly learn from what other communities have done, but, you know, I think we can base it on that. And I did have a question I wanted to ask about the map. Um, I noticed that um, the core district includes, you know, a, a large part of Main Street and a fairly large part of Pleasant Street, but it doesn't go very far up King Street at all. And I'm just wondering, why wouldn't we want to expand the, the best part of downtown Northampton in that in the northerly direction as well as southerly and, and easterly? Uh, is there a reason why you didn't include that in the core? Yeah, so let me just circle back. Thanks, Joel, for also describing the fact that, you know, the whole idea is to do a study of what the existing really desirable and, and well-loved spaces are in Northampton. And Dodds and Flinker did that. They went, they spent many months sort of both in Florence Center, they just focused, and then they did the same thing for downtown Northampton. So that was definitely part of that whole three and a half year <laughs> Um, process. So just wanted to follow up on that. So I appreciate you um, describing that, Joel. And then um, the question about King Street. Um, so um, 
Great question. The Central Business Architecture Committee actually met on Tuesday and had the same concern and talked a lot about how they felt like it should that it should go the core should go up to at least an area where you you know just sort of think about the view shed into the core from King Street and sort of use that as a demarcation. Um, uh, initially, we were looking at um, you know, that one pink finger that goes up King Street is the Hotel Northampton. And um, after that, the character really sort of changes dramatically. Um, and so I think that was our first cut at saying, okay, well, maybe this then becomes side street. But based on the conversation we had with the Central Business Architecture Committee, um, I think, um, and then to your point, obviously, um, I think they certainly would like to see it go up maybe just shy of Allen Place um, along King Street, those first, you know, first depth properties. Yeah, can I just to follow up on that? I mean, I I think that the most beloved part of Northampton is the core. And why would I, I we dealt with this 15 years ago when I was on the zoning revision committee? It was like everybody loves downtown, the core, but we don't want any more of it. You know, we don't want to increase, we don't want it to go up King Street. We want it to go too far down Pleasant Street. We don't want it to go too far to the east on, on Bridge, Road, Bridge Street. So why not? I mean, you get more density, you get more mixture of uses, you get more pedestrians, you, you, you know, it's just better. Um, so that's all. I mean, I, I know the existing condition isn't as good, but why wouldn't we want to make it better? Well, to clarify though, the side street doesn't make it less dense than the core. The buildings still have to have that presence on the street, right? And the mm -hmm. heights are still the same. Um, and the benefit of not having a core designation is that you could get those multifamily housing um, developments that would support that core. Um, whereas if it were the core and we expanded the core, we don't allow residential up to the street in that. I mean, there's that ground floor use limitation for residential. So that was sort of another reason as that character changes, maybe this is the place where we really want to encourage dense housing. Mm -hmm. so. Well, I, mean, I guess all I would say to that is maybe we should reconsider not having it, the, the limitation on multifamily housing on the street in the core. But that's a that's a bigger subject. I, I won't. Yeah, I think we've before. we've covered that pretty thoroughly. Yeah. Okay. So. Thank you. Yeah, um, Dylan. Um, hi, I'm Dylan Sussman. I work for Dotson and Twinker. I'm one of the consultants that worked on the project. Um, so I guess I wanted to I wanted to make it clear that there the main difference between the central business core and the central business side street or the gateway. One of the main differences is the central business core will still be subject to the central business architecture design guidelines and review, um, which has a, a permitting manual that's based very much on um, the historic character of Main Street, um, which is not necessarily exactly the same character that you see on King Street or Lower Pleasant Street. Um, so that's that's one difference tool um, is the central business architecture review. Another difference is about the the dimensions of the public realm. So Main Street generally has very wide sidewalks, uh, whereas when you start going up King Street or down Pleasant Street, those sidewalks are narrow. Um, so there's a difference there that the code in, that the code encodes. Um, and then the third thing is that thing about about ground floor use. Um, <clears throat> Which is really a question about where you think downtown Northampton and development in downtown Northampton wants to go. Does it want to go more towards, is the market there to build new buildings that will support um, additional ground floor retail and commercial space? Or is there more of a market for ground floor residential um, in, in, you know, in redevelopment of sort of underutilized properties? Um, so I think that the code is trying to strike a balance between really maintaining a very active main street, a very active core, um, and then also 
enabling development in the surrounding areas with more residential to support those businesses. Um, and that strategy is applied both in Florence Center and in downtown. Um, and Carolyn's already said that, but I just wanted to reinforce that um, generally, um, I work across the state and in, in Northeast, there's generally a, a stronger market for residential right now than there is for commercial. Um, and in a lot of places where they <clears throat> require commercial on the ground floor, the building gets built and the ground floor commercial stays empty for a long time um, or gets occupied by a use that really doesn't contribute that much more to the street presence than residential would. Um, so those are the points I wanted to make. And I just wanted to thank all of you for, for your comments tonight um, and for, for keeping it civil. <laughs> so thanks, Dylan, appreciate that. Um, and George, um, and then Go back to Karen. We could let uh, Daniel go next. I think let Daniel go next and then I'll help okay. wrap up. Okay, thanks. All right, we're, uh, we're sharing a camera here. So it's, <laughs> it's two of us. Um, I was just curious um, if this is adopted, um, what kind of a timeline for change would do you think we'd see and has there been a big interest from like uh, developers per se? Like how, how would we measure that? Is, is there an interest, you know, do we think this would have an impact within two years, five years, 10 years? Um, I'm at home, so I don't have my crystal ball right here. Um, but, you know, we have, uh, we do know that there's interest in building certainly more residential and more um, sort of flex space um, currently. Um, but it also, you know, we're not a fast growth community. Um, we've already, we've had a couple of big projects, you know, as was mentioned, of course, and you know, the lumber yard and um, 155, those are, you know, um, nonprofit developers who built those um, to address um, primarily affordable housing, but we've also had interest in other housing developers. So I wouldn't say it would be fast. I think, it I mean, I assume that we would sort of move along at a similar pace that we have been. Um, we know that there are other people who want to renovate their properties because the ground floor commercial just isn't working anymore. So I sort of think instead of big major projects that will have multiples of, of those, I don't know, you know, we might get one every two, two, three years or something, but it's probably going to be more on the margins where people haven't been able to figure out a reuse of their building. And we really want to encourage the reuse of these buildings in, in our downtowns. And if they can have more um, opportunities to do that, then that, then we might see some transition and turnover and reinvestment in those existing buildings. Um, I see sort of more of that than sort of big, lots of big projects. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks, George. Um, I just raised my hand because I want I want to let George have the last word because I think he'll do a better job with the last word. Can I just say something quickly, George? I think you'll wrap it up much better than I will. I just wanted to say, uh, number one, first of all, I think this meeting, I think, shows why there will be a good future for Northampton because of the community that we have. I mean, the conversation that's been having we've been having over the past uh, hour and a half. I think is a great uh, example of uh, the kind of community that will draw people, maybe not quickly, but uh, steadily for the long term. Um, and I, I also want to um, just like point out, like I think the lumber yard is a good example. I'm not even sure if there is a retail tenant in there still now. And I think if they were able to have found a way to put more residential units in there, it would have been less vacancy and also make the numbers work to do more affordable housing. Um, so I think that's a, that kind of flexibility uh, is fantastic. And, and there's a lot of low hanging fruit. There's a lot of un, or underutilized commercial space that will pretty immediately turn to housing, which is fantastic. Um, I also think uh, the um, one of the worst things we could do is expand, um, I mean, the downtown is great and the historic downtown is fantastic but putting uh, a huge amount of King Street under 
uh, kind of an ambiguous um, process is like kind of not a good thing. It has a huge chilling effect on development. And if we want to bring multifamily housing to expand the housing stock up King Street, um, leaving it outside of the central business architecture committee, I think is, is definitely the right choice. Um, and uh, anyway, I think this is great progress. There's little dinky things I think we still need to work on a lot of, but uh, this is fantastic progress. So George, go, go ahead. Thank you, David. Um, so Carolyn, thank you very much. Uh, yeah, I do want to wrap up because we have some other things to get to tonight. Um, but the presentation was great. I really want to thank Dylan and Peter at Dodson and Flinker, I think over the, the years that have stayed with this project. And for volunteers, for volunteers like us on the planning board, this, this new form-based code makes our role in the community just so much better because of the, the clear tables, because of the images, the uh, illustrations that we can work with. Um, because right now our zoning guidelines are a little bit Greekish. Um, and it's hard to interpret sometimes, but this really will make uh, folks on the planning board, the ZBA, those other boards, our, our work much better, I think, in working with applicants. And Carolyn, I, I hope that this, um, this draft has also gone by some developers. I'm not sure if they have the time to look at it as closely as you and your office mates have or some of us, but it would be great to get their, the developer's feedback um, to see where they see any kind of potholes in this new guideline. And I, and I also want to urge people, I had a chance this week to look through those 102 pages, um, which wasn't a, a, a ton of fun, but uh, I did call out a few areas that were a little confusing. So I'll set those out in an email to Carolyn. And without putting too much more work on her plate, if other people are able to do that, there could be typos in there. There could be some things that we've missed over the past three years. Please send those over to Carolyn because it, it's really, really helpful to have those extra eyes on it. Um, so again, thank you very much. This is going to go a long way. And David, I, I appreciate what you said. It's been a great conversation. And I think all of this bodes well for the future in Northampton. So thanks, everybody, for joining us tonight. And uh, stay tuned for our next little conversation about 33 King Street. So I think Wayne, are you around still? Of course. To make it through. I'm here. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna put the screen back up um, for your thing. Can you see that? Yep, I can see it. Okay, okay, hold on. I gotta switch it to the next. Okay, there. Can you see that? Yep, that's great. Okay. okay. Thanks very much. So. This is mostly a, a coming a coming attraction feature. We won't need to, don't spend need to spend a lot of time in this. We really just want to start getting input on this. We're going to be doing some follow up forums probably in March. We're still not sure. Um, so this is 33 King Street. You probably know it as Probate Court, or perhaps you know it as one of the ugliest buildings in downtown Northampton. Um, Probate Court closed. I can't even remember, three years ago, four years ago, um, and our legislative delegation working with the city and Department of Capital Asset Management Maintenance worked out a deal by which the land is coming to the city for a dollar for no cost with the condition that we sell the property and then we split the proceeds by a formula with the Commonwealth. If we keep the property, we have to pay an enormous amount, probably frankly more than we think it's worth. So that's not really a scenario for us to keep the property. Um, so we're, we're beginning the conversation with the planning board and with energy and sustainability, with DNA, with the Chamber of Commerce, and eventually with a big public forum on what are the conditions we wanna put in this property when we sell it? Um, and they're probably gonna range from things which are absolute musts. So at least our draft, this may not be what we do, but our draft will be, it has to be a fossil fuel free building, um, probably has to be ground source heat, has to be super insulated. So there's certain things that we probably wanna do that are musts. And then, because we don't really know exactly what the market's gonna demand or you know, offer, 
we're gonna have to figure out some sort of way to score compared to different things, right? So we want more affordable housing downtown, but we're working on a number of other sites for affordable housing and a site with 15,000 cars a day maybe isn't a site that we wanna dedicate for affordable housing. We want high-end housing because that's what supports downtown businesses. We want commercial because that's what generates foot traffic. So there's probably gonna be a number of things where we're open to proposals from a developer, um, but we wanna have some way to, to compare those things. The project's been delayed. If you had heard our earlier schedule, we'd hope we would own the property by the end of, of December and we would have done a public forum probably in, in January, the month is about to end. Um, the problem is we can't take title until we understand hazardous materials. And we did what's called a phase one environmental site assessment and found evidence that at one point in the past, there were four underground gas tanks. DCAM, the Commonwealth, has no records that they can offer on what happened to those tanks. Probably they were cleaned up, probably they were removed, but we just don't know that yet. So we have to do some borings on the site um, and all that's gonna take another two or three months. So at this point, our schedule is it's probably coming to the city in June, maybe May, maybe July, depending on what we find for the environmental site assessment. Um, and so we've slowed down the process a little bit um, but we just sort of opening this up tonight. I say we're, we, we know that each forum are gonna hear different comments. So we've committed to as many different forums as possible. They say, you know, chamber, uh, DNA, energy and sustainability, planning board, public forum, community developments, all those things can be part of the process. Um, our process is we're gonna to listen to all the different voices we can. We're gonna come up with a draft request for proposals that has to go back to city council for approval. So city council approved the city taking a deed for the property, approved the city selling the property for redevelopment, but they want a final approval of the uh, RFP before it goes forward. So that's my quick overview. Um, just a couple of things to be aware of. There are some site constraints. We assume most likely the building's gonna come down. It does have asbestos and the asbestos has to be remediated whether the building's reused or not but that's an expensive process. Um, there, are made, there is a major storm sewer that goes to the parking lot. Um, today, we hold an easement for the public to park in the parking lot on nights and weekends. And we hold an easement through the property for access to the bike path. But as soon as the city takes title to the property, those easements get wiped out, it's called a merger of interest. So probably we want those easements back. It doesn't show up in this sketch, but there's an alleyway that goes from this parking lot to Main Street on the east side of Fitzwillies um, for cars. We Again, our, our tentative plan is we would extinguish the access for cars to go through there because we don't want a driveway on Main Street, but we would do that only in return for having an access for the public to pass and repass on foot and bicycle to provide access from Main Street up to the bike path. So there's some, those are the kinds of things we're looking at. Um, so beyond that, I would just love to get people's comments. Again, there will be a public forum later, so this isn't your only chance, but if people have thoughts and comments, that would be great. Um, and David, were you raising your hand for this or is that from before? Okay. And Carolyn, you're probably gonna have to call on people so I yeah. let you, if there are hands raised. So. I saw Sarah had her hand up. I don't know where she went. Should I stop screen share or do people want to see this? Any thoughts, I think, George? I think you can stop. We can always put it back when you need to. Okay. Um, so I don't know what happened to Sarah, but um, Bob, oh, there you go. <laughs> yeah, Hi. sorry about that. No, no problem. Um, I just, um, my, as you began talking, I thought, oh, this is very interesting. I was just in that parking lot this afternoon thinking, wow, that's a big hole. Who's going to fix that? <laughs> <laughs> and having dealt with uh, DCAM over the years, as you did also with the state hospital property, I have some clue about the uh, effort to try to get records out of them. Um, so my first thought was, uh, has the asbestos been cleaned out? Uh, are there oil tanks? Are there old 
uh, oil, um, you know, little pipes under the concrete of the floor. Um, you know, lots of things about the building. I think it was built in the era of PCBs in caulking, similar to the Latterly Graduate Research Tower at UMass. Uh, and you're abutting the uh, the railroad, and you know better than I do about the contaminated soils that tend to be along railroads. Um, so just wanted to, you know, uh, there have been a handful of projects where the state, um, and I work for the state, has offered properties to various municipalities, and I always uh, say, well, you know, let's make sure everything is transparent and eyes wide open. Um, uh, who's going to remain responsible for this expensive set of problems. Um, so I'm glad to see you are very well aware of them. Yeah, those are all really good points, Sarah. I mean, just for everyone else so you know, um, there's two kinds of assessments one does. A environmental site assessment, which is basically about hazardous materials. We've hired O'Reilly, Talbot, and Oakham, who've done the phase one. It's public, if anybody wants it. And they did, as, as Sarah mentioned, they found enough clues of other potential things that we need to go to a phase two. Um, but it, we, again, we need access, we need approval from the court system and DCAM before we can do that. The other kind of assessment we decided not to do is the asbestos assessment, the materials in the building. And the reason we didn't is we don't need to know that to take title to the building. Almost certainly the property has enough value to cover those things. And it's basically, we're gonna sell it at a you know, substantial discount and whoever buys the property is gonna pay for the cost of remediation and presumably demolition. In, because in DCAM won't? DCAM wants to be out of this and is not, right? So this deal they've done in the past, DCAM would sell properties on their own. And as Sarah sort of hinted, that is often a multiple year process. Mm -hmm. They've changed to this new model. We were, I think the second or third community where they say, hey community, you take on all the headache of selling the property and you get 50% of the revenue. This is not primarily about revenue for us. It's really not about revenue at all in the short term. So that's why we're happy to get this. You know, that's why saying things like, you know, uh, you deal with asbestos, um, you have to be fossil fuel free. It discounts the sales price, but that's okay. We're, we're willing to do that. So we are aware of those things. Although again, until we do the phase two, I think you make a good point is that um, none of these materials are um, uh, will sink the ship. They're not, uh, they aren't things people haven't dealt with before that you haven't dealt with before that I, okay. that contractors, the developers haven't dealt with before. So, and at least good. a couple of tanks that were there once were gas, not oil and gas is actually lighter. So it moves more rapidly. So that's certainly the reason. So we, mm -hmm. we will not take the property until we know about potential leaks. But the asbestos, you know, we can take it. Thank you. I see Robert Ross. Okay, I figured how to unmute myself this time. Um, this was not something that interests me, but happened to be here, and here it is. Um, I know that the city of Northampton is desperate for a resilience hub, and um, this could be a perfect property for that. And I don't think we should need to be in the real estate business either. So I think it would be great to take the property and put on an RFP for a resilience hub and have somebody else build that for us and rent it and maintain it and provide those services. And we would still have control of what well, the bet. It's not so much about buying the property or getting pro the profit. We know we don't see the profit. It's just gonna disappear into our funding, but um, the best part about it is we can be in the driver's seat and we can pick the customer and we can make it happen in a way we want it to happen. And hopefully we can rewrite those easements or send, put out the RFP in a way that we can capture those easements again so they best uh, serve the city. Yes, you're absolutely right about being in the driver's seat about being in control of doing those restrictions. We have looked at it for resilience hub. There's two big disadvantages. First is we would have to pay the price based on the Commonwealth appraisals and their appraisals are universally higher than anyone local. So just as one example- No, I'm not talking about taking it over. No, with, with selling it, we could put out an RFP to have somebody else build the resilience hub. 
We don't yeah. need to be in that business. Yeah, we, we definitely look at that. That is one of the options. One of the things is that's going to be a very long process. So you know, we also have a city council surplus to piece of land behind city hall that we could do as resilience hub, but it's also a three or four year process. Um, and so our preference for resilience hub, if we can make it work as an existing building, if that doesn't work, yes, this is one of the options we're looking at. Okay, Amy, Kayleen, I think was next. Quick um, clarification question. Under the new form-based code, were that to pass, would this property fall outside of central business district or within central business district? The core, sorry. Um, so right now it's showing up as in the side street district. So um, the review um, standards would be by the planning board same, you know, very um, detailed design and form requirements still in the side street, but it would be one, it would be going to planning board instead of both planning board and central business. I had was but really there, thinking of the, the first floor residential would be possible yes. theoretically now um, and presumably hotel. Would yeah, be hotel allowable. in either one, hotel in across all the central business. Yeah. Thanks. And Amy, remember, regardless of how the zoning line is, this is certainly going back to Robert's point of us being the driver's seat, regardless of the zoning district, we can add additional performance standards on either use or design. Thanks. Um, okay, David Murphy. Hello, Hi, good evening. So uh, I'm sure some of you are aware of it, but the vacant part of that site was the location of the YMCA historically mm -hmm. before it was demoed and uh, moved moved up to a residential neighborhood for some reason. Um, and you know who knows what the hell they buried in that hole when they took it out. But one of the reasons the registry building is so ugly is that they basically built it around what was the parking garage for the Hotel Northampton. So the inside of that building is probably I mean, it's a nasty old concrete building that held up automobiles when they used to not be made out of plastic. So uh, demoing that thing is gonna be a real feat. And that's probably one of the reasons there were gas. I mean, they sold gas there, they did car service there, they did all kinds of stuff in, in that nasty old building. And the state just sort of blocked in around it and turned it into a probate court. And I think that, uh, you know, that's something to keep in, in, your, in mind that that's, like a fortress of a nasty old concrete parking garage underneath all that ugly concrete block. So taking that thing down is not gonna be a walk in the park because it's a formidable structure. And you know, in the days they demoed the YMCA, we weren't really all that conscious of anything but knocking bricks in the hole and paving over top of it. So whoever digs there is gonna have some surprises too. You know, I know when, they, when, when Mr. Cooper did the uh, parking lot next to me, he found a a, an asbestos clad boiler from the house that used to be there. When it burned down, they just pushed everything in the hole and buried it. So, you know, hopefully they didn't do that with, but there's a lot of surprises there. So um, I like the fact that it would be used. I'm like the fact that there'll be some infill that uh, might draw more people and might generate more taxes and make them, them more viable. But yeah, there, there are some skeletons in them, their closets. So uh, proceed with caution because it's, it's, it's an interesting site that, could offer more surprises than we'd like. <laughs> yeah, thank you, I agree. Um, Elaine, Jendu. Hi, Car Carolyn, thank you. I was a state employee and I do know for a fact that the state did try so hard to fix that building. They spent so much money to fix that building and they could not do it because it's, basically contaminated. And so that's why they had to go to Atwood to build another building because it was just impossible, but they did spend a lot of money to try to fix that building. So I think that building really needs to come down and it, it will cost a lot of money. And I do agree that um, with Bob Ross that maybe a resilience center would be good there. I mean, it's in downtown Northampton. I think it's a good idea. Thank you. Thank you, Elaine. 
I don't see any other hands. Comment. So. Okay, this is great. Again, you know, sort of keep the keep thinking about the ideas. We once we have a better sense of the actual time period, we'll come back to the community again and say tentatively in in March. So you know, you haven't lost your chance as well. That's all I have, Carolyn. Thank you very much. Okay, thanks. And I don't think we've obtained a quorum in the planning board. So it looks like you're gonna to have to vote to continue that public hearing and the A&Rs um, to your next meeting, which would be February 10th. Um, and I would say, put it up at seven o'clock. I haven't looked, it's possible you'd have a plenty, you'd have some permit, but you could always, you know, I think seven o'clock would be appropriate. And you can uh, so oh. I'll move we um, continue the hearing till uh, seven o'clock on February tenth. Is that what you said? Tenth. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Second. Okay. Thanks, Melissa. Um, so and the other items too, you'd have to we we'll just have to slide over to the tenth. So we're continuing the hearing on the form-based code and on the uh, ANRs. No, there's no form-based code hearing. This was just a public forum, so it's really just the ag, um, the ag, oh, the, just the, uh, the beverage uh, okay. ag. Yeah. Um, so the next form, the next step in the code would be: we're still we have another meeting with Central Business, and then you know getting all the comments in from you all and any other members of the public have comments, we'll review those internally and then put the package together. The city solicitor still has to review the package <laughs> and then before it gets introduced to council. So that's, um, I think all you all can do for your meeting <laughs> since you don't have a quorum. So the motion's been made and seconded. So we still need to go through a void vote. Yeah, so um, yep. we might just ask if there's any discussion, Carolyn. I don't know if there's anyone who was here specifically for this ordinance amendment. Yeah, I don't to, know. You do, you of course didn't have anybody at the last one, right? For this, yeah. Um, uh, Bob, did you have your hand up or was that from last time? You're muted. Okay, sorry. I just want to know if, if, since the meeting's being pushed forward, is there going to be public comment again on February 10th for the form-based code? No, this wasn't a public hearing for the form-based code. It's just a public forum. Okay. So there's no need to, I mean, this was sort of the last big public forum before it gets formally introduced to city council, at which point it'll be referred out for public hearing. So either city council and planning board will hold a joint public hearing um, that will be advertised um, and notice mailed, you know, um, to all actually notice is going to be mailed to all the property owners that are within these mapped areas. Um, but um, the only thing that's being pushed forward is um, a public hearing that was on the agenda for tonight. tonight. But which okay. the, yeah. All right. Thanks for the clarification. So right, and to clarify for people, that public hearing was for an ordinance amendment around farm stands to have entertainment and perhaps to sell alcohol that they um, create on their own farms. So it's very different than the public hearing on the form-based so code. So we're, that's what we're moving forward till the 10th. And, and today was to be a continuation from a previous meeting, so. Right. <laughs> So the motion's been made and seconded and we discussed it. Um, let's, are there any other discussions? 
and the four of us will go to a voice vote. Uh, or the three of us. Three of you. Yeah, David. Hmm, I finally have power. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I guess, please. All right, Melissa. Yes. And George. Okay, it's unanimous. All right. 